I don't know if I quite was able to match the Nittany Lion blue. Is that <laughs> close? So um, before we begin, I thought it would be interesting to take just a minute to talk about how I came to Vygotsky, because as Jim mentioned, I came at, through, <coughs> through Marx and Engels' work. Um, I started teaching back in the late 60s and actually got fired after two years, in the words of the headmaster, for making the students think too much. <laughs> and in a sense, he was right, because we thought about social issues. And I then um, went to get my master's, but soon became involved in the anti-war movement, women's right to choose, and a lot of other struggles for social justice and change. And in the process, joined the Socialist Workers' Party. And the Socialist Workers' Party has its origins in the fight against Stalinism. And so I, that was my, my perspective, was looking at Marx in, in, in uh, opposition to what was going on in the Soviet Union under Stalin. And so um, after I, I did, it was 20 years of full-time political activity. And I, I uh, did the study of Marx, not as an academic exercise, but to try to really put it into to practice. And then after 20 years, kids came along and I, I went back to teaching and was able to teach at this high school in downtown LA that had 4,500 students in it. And about 80% of them were second language learners. There was the uh, 25 different languages represented in the, the school. And so um, it was a wonderful experience, but I felt that I could do more if I became a teacher educator. And so I went to the University of New Mexico, and there I met Vera John Steiner. And we right away established a, a very good working relationship with each other. And I've been fortunate to be a, a mentee, a collaborator, co-author, and friend of Vera's for 20 years. And so I come, that's my, my background as, a, as an educator and as, a, as an activist. And I don't come from a perspective of psychology, and I don't, I'm not an applied linguist. So with that background, I, I found early on that in looking at, at Vygotsky's work, I appreciated his reliance on Marx and Engels' work, but I also was struck by the misunderstanding or misinterpretation of his, his work. And so I focused on his methodology. And Vygotsky says, method means two different things, the research methods, the technology of the experiment, and the epistemological method or methodology, which determines the research goal, the place of the science, and its nature. Now, all of these quotes will be, that are not attributed, will be from Vygotsky. But it, often people focus in on the first meaning and not so much on the, the second one. And the second one is the one he writes extensively about in the crisis of psychology. And <clears throat> in there, he's talking about building a general science, building a methodology of science. And so he then writes, methodology is the linchpin through which philosophy guides science. No philosophical system can take possession of psychology directly without the help of methodology, i.e., without the creation of a general science. And so in order to create this general science, Vygotsky said that you couldn't just take the theory of, of dialectics and apply it directly. You needed intermediary theories. And um, a, that's a key part of Marx and Engels' dialectical approach is the importance of the intermediary theories. Marx and Engels got together in 
1845 in Brussels. And their purpose was to try to synthesize the major thinkers at that time and to come up with a methodological approach to, to study reality, not human social formations, not human psyche, but to study or nature, um, the physical world, but a methodological approach to study reality. And in that, they drew on, on Ricardo and Smith in political economy, in, in Just and Saint-Simon in, in French, the French socialists, and then the German philosophers, Kant and Hegel. And they relied very heavily on Hegel's dialectics. But his dialectics, they said, was not materialist. It became idealist. And then they looked at Feuerbach, who was one of the foremost materialist thinkers at that time. But his, his materialism wasn't dialectical. And so they looked at creating what's been ca called dialectical materialism, though they never used that terminology. And that terminology has been severely misused by Stalin and the Soviet bureaucracy. But very quickly, the basic principles behind their thinking was first that everything is in a constant state of change. And what we need to do is then look at the laws of motion behind that, that change. That the methodology has to incorporate the notion of change. And that <clears throat> everything comes into existence. And so we need to look at how something's brought into existence, what forces are behind its development, and then what qualitative changes take place in its, its development. And this is a key piece of their thinking. And in looking at qualitative change, they looked at the unification of distinct processes. It's oftentimes put as the, the, antith the thesis, antithesis, and th synthesis. But that doesn't really get to the way that they were using it. Um, they were talking about the unification and then the creation of something new. And that creation of something new is an important piece of Vygotsky's work. And then with dialectics, it's looking at the systemic interconnectedness of all reality. That things can't be isolated. That they ha you have to look at their connections in order to understand them. <coughs> Engels makes the point that these principles are not the starting point of the investigation, but its final result. They are not applied to nature and human history, but abstracted from them. And this is a, a very important notion as we go forward, the importance of looking at the creation of intermediary theories. And so Vygotsky writes that direct application of the theory of dialectical materialism to the problems of natural science and psychology is impossible, just as it is impossible to apply it directly to history and sociology. This quote was then taken by Kazulin, and Kazulin puts these words into Vygotsky's mouth. A theory of dialectical materialism cannot be applied to the problems of psychology. And Kazulin was ed edited the Thought and Language, the 1986 version, which was based on a 1962 version by Hoffman and Vacar. And Hoffman and Vacar cut out all references to Marx and Engels and dialectical materialism and historical materialism. And I don't know their motivation, whether they were thinking that that would, in the post-McCarthy period, Cold War period, that that would, that would taint Vygotsky's work in a way that would not allow people to appreciate it. But the 86 version that Kazulin used was based on that 1962. He added things to it and took things out. But this is the, the lens through which he was putting things in and taking things out of Vygotsky's work. It's a, a highly condensed version. <clears throat>
I sometimes refer to it as a Reader's Digest version. So Vygotsky says then, in order to create such intermediary theories, methodologies, general sciences, we must reveal the essence of the given area of phenomena, the laws of their change, their qualitative and quantitative characteristics, their causality. We must create categories and concepts appropriate to it. And this is what Marx and Engels did with looking at human social formations. They went back to the origins the, with the understanding that humans changed nature, and in changing nature, changed humanity as a basic premise. And then they looked at the development of human social formations and with a particular eye on how it, sh it shone light on 19th century British capitalism, which is what they're, he was mostly focusing in on. So by looking at the actual human social formations, Marx and Engels developed some categories and concepts that they would then use to create an inter intermediary theory. Value, commodity, class, means of production, including human labor activity, and then the different modes of production that are part of human social formations. And based on that, they then developed a theory of historical materialism. And so there is this interplay always between the subject that they're looking at and the theory. One begin, they form one, inform one another. Vygotsky took the same approach, but he was, the subject matter for him was the human psyche. He said that his work is based on the foundation of historical materialism, that the psyche exists within social formations. And for looking at the social formations, he would use historical materialism. But historical materialism is an intermediary theory to look at social formations, not at the human psyche. And so Vygotsky said, in order to look at the human psyche, we need to develop categories and concepts that relate to the human psyche, meaning thinking processes, language processes, mediation, activity, senses, and emotion. And from that, he then was working on developing a theory of psychological materialism. And he quotes Plekhanov, Marxism does not accept the possibility of explaining or describing one kind of phenomena by means of ideas or concepts developed to explain or describe another kind. And one of the, the key things about the interpretation of Vygotsky's work is, is that it's come through the ideas, the lenses of Leontiev with whom Vygotsky worked, and then there is a, a break in the, the early 30s, and they, they had differing views, and Leontiev, even in 34 and 35, came out with two papers that were extremely critical of Vygotsky's work. But then when Vygotsky's work was rehabilitated after the Khrushchev revelations in 1956, it had been banned for 20 years. When it came out, it came out with Leontiev's view of Vygotsky. And that influenced Russian psychologists, and it played a very big part in how Vygotsky's work was interpreted in the English-speaking world, because Michael Cole and James Wirch both studied with Leontiev. So, this is the perspective that Marx and Engels and Vygotsky developed about using ideas and concepts in one area to describe another kind. Vygotsky's idea was clear. The elaboration of the theoretical, methodologic foundations of a Marxist psychology must begin with a psychological analysis of the practical labor activity of 
of humans on the basis of Marxist positions. So he is taking a contrary view to what Marx and Engels talked about in terms of methodology and what Vygotsky talked about in terms of methodology. You, psychological analysis doesn't begin with looking at practical labor activity. It begins by looking at the human psyche. One of the things that Vygotsky did early on was and he was writing in from 24 to 34, and Stalin came to power in 24. By the time Vygotsky was writing uh, in the late middle to late 20s and 30s, this a bureaucracy that was founded on based on more well-to-do landowners, peasants and government functionaries had seized political power in the Soviet Union. By the late, late 20s, out of the 24 members of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party that led the Russian Revolution, all but one had been sent into exile or executed. That one, of course, being Stalin. But this bureaucracy then controlled all aspects of Soviet life, it, from economics, the social side. They even used Marx and Lenin to talk about how to grow corn. But it was all very much from the top down. And this was happening in psychology. So there was different approaches then to how to develop psychology. Vygotsky here, when he talks about Marxist psychology is talking about psychology as it's being developed by the Soviet bureaucracy led by Stalin. And so Marxist psychology does not have its own methodology and attempts to find it ready-made in the haphazard psychological statements of the founders of Marxism. And so this is in contrast. There is, in Marx, Marx and Engels did not talk about psychology. They talked about just a little bit about consciousness and talked about class consciousness. But there, in their works, there is no methodology for studying the human psyche. Leontiev says, the process of gradually reviewing the significance of the classics of Marxism created a broad theory that disclosed the nature and general laws of psychology and consciousness. Totally opposite approach to Vygotsky and Marx and Engels. So Vygotsky said of this, the work that was being produced at that time, we cannot expect anything more of this work than a pile of more or less accidental citations in their Talmudic interpretation. But citations, even when they have been well ordered, never yield systems. And that was the, the way to pr approach science under Stalin, was that you go to Marx and Engels, pick some quotes that seem to bolster your position, and then that becomes the, the science. But even now, it must not be said that psychology has exhausted the treasure chest of Marxist-Leninist ideas. For this reason, we turn again and again to the works of Karl Marx, which resolve even the most profound and complex theoretical problems of psychological science the exact opposite approach that Vygotsky used. So what is, what is it that Vygotsky is studying? The key thing that he is looking at is the relationship between thinking processes and systems and speaking processes and systems. I'm teaching a, a, a seminar on Vygotsky now uh, several of the graduate students say that they are in, from special education. And so when they keep hearing speaking, they then start thinking about what about the nonverbal children. And I think speaking, and this is the thing that, that Jim was alluding to with Alyesha and I talking about, the three of us talking about the, the me, Vygotsky's meaning of especially the word uh, rich. Which, which, and so instead of using speaking here, I'm going to talk about languaging processes. And that's been used by Meryl Swain and, and others 
in a different sense. Here, I'm referring it to, to it in the same way that Vygotsky was talking about speaking, and that is looking at all of those processes that are involved in the production and reception of co meaningful communication through the use of symbols or signs. So he starts off and says that these thinking systems, perception, memory, attention, and practical intellect, have a pre-verbal development so that there's not, speaking is not involved in these thinking processes. And in the same, language is not involved in these, in these speaking processes. And in the same way, thinking is not involved in the initial languaging processes of babies with babbling, cooing, attending to the human voice and gesture. And he said, but as children begin to acquire language, these two distinct processes, systems, unify. And he says that in this unification, they have created something new. And this something new that has been created is what Vygotsky says he is going to, to study. And the, the Rechnoyev Michelinia is, is again the sort of the speaking thinking, but it doesn't really capture that. It's more of the, the unification. And so what I'm going to refer to it as is a thinking languaging system. And that green there is that system. And that's what Vygotsky, that's the central focus of his work, is this system that's created with thinking and languaging. So in order to look at it, he first of all puts it into a broader system, looking at the connectedness. Is there temperature control in here? No, OK. Um, so the first system he looks at is the relationship between the consciousness and the brain. And what he, he looks at is the unification of the, the mind, consciousness, and the brain is the psyche. So that instead of the mind slash body, he's talking about the psyche, which is psychology, the study of the psyche. So the psyche then is this unification, this entity created by the unification of consciousness and the, the brain. And he looks at the natural systems. Pe children are born into a physical situation with the biological system and then the, the natural mental processes. And it's important in looking at those, those natural mental processes. At first, they're biological. But very quickly, because of the intervention of culture and people, those become not just biological, but what Vygotsky calls el elementary mental. They, it's called elementary, elementary mental processes, <coughs> I mean functions. And he uses processes as opposed to functions. A big influence, of course, is the social cultural. And there's a lot of things that could be put on here, but the two main artifacts of humanity, tools and language, and then the social formation. So the individual psyche is born into a social cultural system, starting with their infancy, the caretakers, how they're taken care of. And I wanted to look first here at this notion of psychological tools. Because that's put forward as a central concept in Vygotsky's work. And the reason that it is, is that he it's based mostly on a figure that he, a diagram that he, he used that <coughs> excuse me, looked at the fact that tool use and sign use both are mediating activity. 
He says that these lines here are diverging because the use of tools and the use of signs become very, very separate, very, very different. And it's really not meaningful to talk about them in the same way. <clears throat> he says, we must emphasize also that our diagram is intended to present the logical relation of the concepts, but not the genetic or functional on the whole real relations of the phenomena. So in other words, he's saying this is a very limited analogy that is not of much use at all, and yet is put forward as a central concept. This sentence was omitted from mind and society. Why? Taken right out of a paragraph. The reason is it undercuts the narrative that was being put forward by Leontiev. There's also a critique of Vygotsky's so-called separation of the natural and the cultural. And this has become so prevalent that it's just sort of used as, as good coin. And the argument was put forward by the Stalin bureaucracy that <clears throat> Vygotsky had a view where on the one hand you had the biological mind, mental processes, and on the other hand you had culture. And the culture was mostly language. And so that language didn't really start to affect the elementary mental functions until the child started to acquire language. So they argued that he made this separation between the two, which could not be further from the truth. He talks about how these elementary mental processes are transformed and conditioned by the culture pretty much from birth. And he talks about the, the human, that infants at three weeks attending to the, being able to pick out the human voice. Vera gives a very good example of how perception can be culturally modified, where she talks about a child that's on the mother's back out in the field is going to have a very different perception than a child that's lying in a, in a crib. So this argument that he, he made this separation is totally false. He does, as he does with most unifications, say that within this unification, through abstraction, you can begin to look at the processes of one or the other aspects of the unification. But he says that they are, they are together from the start. According to Vygotsky's idea, we must distinguish two levels in human mental processes. The first is mind left to itself. The second is mind, the mental processes armed with tools and auxiliary means. The first he called natural, the second cultural. His sharp contraposition of natural and cultural mental processes is not justified. Again, a complete misrepresentation of Vygotsky's work, and it's one that comes across pretty much that this is an accepted fact. For the, the idea that mind left to itself, and then the contraposition. Stalin, the bureaucracy used this argument that you can't really look at language because it's not material. It's idealist. So any language study is idealist. Well, Marx in the German ideology, one little side note on the German ideology, if they finished writing it in 87, and then um, it, it had a publisher all lined up. But because of the revolutions that were sweeping across Europe in 1848, the publisher got cold feet. And so Marx said it was put on the shelf where it was subjected to the gnawing criticism of mice. But in there, Marx and Engels write, the mind is from the very outset afflicted with the curse of being burdened with matter, which here makes its appearance in the form of agitated layers of air, sounds, in short, of language. 
material. Language is as old as consciousness. Language is practical, real consciousness it's, that exists for other humans as well. And only therefore does it exist for me. Language, like consciousness, only arises from the need, the necessity of intercourse with other humans. And Vygotsky uses this quote at the very end of thinking and speech. In the original, there's quotations and a citation to Marx and Engels. But then, as the second and third edition of this work came out, the quotation marks and the citation totally disappear. Why? Because it goes against this narrative that language is idealism, or that you can, from a Marxist perspective, study language. And Leontiev, as people know, substituted labor activity for language. Another system, of course, is the historical. And Vygotsky looks at the species, the, the individual in a historical process, and using historical materialism. One other area that he talks about is the system of the personality. And by personality, he's talking about the, the cultured being that is created that, through the development of the, the psyche. And he talks about sensuous activity. And Marx's first thesis of Feuerbach writes, the chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism, that of Feuerbach included, is that the thing, reality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object or of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity, practice, not subjectively. So he's saying then there's, there's the sensuous world, reality. And then there's the sensuous being, the conscious human being. But what's left out is the sensuous activity of the human being in the sensuous world. This is often used as a, the foundational piece for Leontiev's activity theory. But when they talk about it, they often leave out the sensuous and they leave out not subjectively. Because Vygotsky, I mean, Marx and Engels are not talking about human labor activity here. Human labor activity is a part of sensuous activity. What they're talking about is the relationship between the sensuous world and the sensuous conscious being. That's what they're talking about with sensuous activity. And Vygotsky's notion of what he means by sensuous activity is captured in the concept of perishivanya. How would you translate that? <laughs> All right. While you're, while you're pondering it, it doesn't translate, as you can see. It doesn't translate very well to, to English. It's sort of the emotional experience, lived experience. But what Vygotsky is talking about is with the, the personality, the individual, and the environment broadly conceived to include social relations, that those are unified. And the unification is, the, is perishivanya. It means the way that the sensuous world, through sensuous activity, is taken in, understood, appreciated, appropriated, lived through, and acted on. So it's this, the interface between the psyche and the, the material and, and social worlds. A key piece that's missing a lot of times in looking at this is that Vygotsky talked about the way that the perception takes place actually changes the environment. And we don't usually think about you know, this notion of our perception changing the environment. But if you take it just even on a physical level, if you were to take a movie camera and play it across the room and then put it on video, it would be all blurred. 
But if you shake your heads, it's not blurred. And that's the, the light waves that are coming in are exactly the same. The perception, the mental activity that takes place is changing the environment. So it's a key concept, especially if we look at it in education. Each one of the students will have a different parishabanya of that experience that's taking place in the, the classroom. And so he looks at the parishabanya in relationship to social situation of development, which is another key concept that often gets misconfused, gets mis misinterpreted or confused in that social situation of development is seen as almost being the same as social context. That it's you're in a social situation of development, that you're in a context. What's left out is that Vygotsky's talking about a relationship. He's talking about a relationship between where a child is in his or her de development, cultural cognitive development, and the social situation. So the two are play a role on one another. It's not as if one is an actor in the, this context. It's that the relationship is created by both the individual and the social. And that relationship changes as the child's de cultural development progresses. And then, of course, emotion, which is a huge piece of Vygotsky's work. Um, and it can be looked at in relationship to, to sense. And when Jim was talking about Vera saying, you know, not understanding Vygotsky until 10 or 11 times through, well, on the 14th or 15th time through, I may have come upon a, an idea about how to talk about sense in relationship to meaning. And that's a conversation that Jim and I have had over the last decade. Um, if we think of the child being born with its senses, so that their, their sensuous activity is starting right then. And as they take in things from their, their, the sensuous world, they are making sense of their world. They're not making meaning of their world. So they develop a sense. And that sense, then, is key when they start acquiring language. Because the first words are very much about sense and the sensual the sensuous relationship between the word and whatever the object is so if a child is playing with a doggy and here's the word doggy that the sound is not this object the sound is the experience that the child is going through the smell the fur the barking all of looking all of that is part of the experience. So the first word is totally sense. Then, as children interact, they then become, they learn the conventional meaning of the word. So they are making meaning of the world through sense. So when that the word comes in with the conventional meaning, it's infused with sense. And as more meaning comes in, Vygotsky talks about building an internal structure of meaning, which we will we'll get to. But the relationship then is that sense, as he talks about, is all of the psychological facts that are connected with that word, and that meaning is the most stable part of it. Their sense will change all of the time. But in their inner speech and in their inner, inner, <coughs> internal system of meaning, meaning is more constant, stable, 
than sense, even though sense predominates. And then he, right after that, he says, it's the most stable. And then I think two sentences later, he says, but meaning is inconstant. What he's talking about is that this system of meaning that children develop is inconstant. That's developing. And so <clears throat> in order to look at this thinking languaging system, Vygotsky uses the, the, a, the concept of Znachenia Slova. And his, his approach was that you can't just take, we're looking at this unification. We can't just break it apart and look at all of the elements in one and the elements in the other and then hope to put it back together. We have to look at it as a system, as a unity. And then what, what unit, he says, can be both primary, irreducible, and yet maintain the essence of the whole? And it's interesting, he, in the Russian, it's not unit of analysis. It's the unit to be analyzed. And when you think about the difference of unit of analysis often could be a sort of a lens through which you're looking at it. He's talking about we need to find a unit that we can examine in detail and in examining that unit understand the system as a whole. So the whole for him is this languaging, thinking languaging system. There's some significant issues with the the word is Nechenia Slova, a primary one being translation. It's translated into English as word meaning. Then the emphasis becomes the meaning of words, external meanings of words. Vygotsky's not talking about external meanings of words. Those play a role in it. What he's talking about is an internal meaning and how language helps to create this internal structure system of meaning. And so that throws, that translation just there pivots it off of what Vygotsky's really looking at. And it's also a problem of what he considers the whole. It's almost across the board that people, when they talk about the, the unit, talk about it as being a unit of consciousness. That Vygotsky was using Znachenia Slova to look at consciousness or the mind. He wasn't looking at consciousness. He was looking at this thinking languaging system, which is a part of consciousness, but he wasn't looking at consciousness as a whole. And then Leontiev says, well, this unit really doesn't suffice for looking at, at consciousness and then substitutes another one. The reason people look, think about that this is he's talking about consciousness is at the very end of thinking and speech, he says, the world is a microcosm of consciousness related to consciousness like a living cell is related to an organism like an atom is related to the cosmos. The thing that seems to make sense, but the thing that's left out is at the very beginning of the, in, in the introduction to the book, he says, at the end of our study, at the end of our study of looking at this, this Nechenia Slova as a unit of this thinking languaging system, we have been brought to the threshold of another problem, and that is, looking at the relationship between Znachenia Slova and consciousness. And right before this passage, he points out, our investigation has brought us to the threshold of the problem of consciousness, the problem of the relationship between the word and consciousness. So by substituting consciousness in there, it's a distortion of what Vygotsky is really talking about. And I mentioned substitution. And so Leontia says this unit doesn't work to study consciousness, so he substitutes another one, goal-directed human labor activity. And the, in doing that, 
in developing the unit, Vygotsky says the unit is a product of analysis. It's not just something that we pick. It's, you have to analyze to come up with the unit. That analysis doesn't exist in looking at the unit of human labor activity. Then in the introduction to thinking and speaking, between 1925 and 1930, Vygotsky focused on an analytic unit that he called the instrumental act, a unit of activity medi mediated by signs that are used as tools or instruments to control behavior. <clears throat> The unit wasn't called instrumental act. It was Znachenia Sloga, very different. It wasn't a unit of activity. It was a unit of this system. And I put mediated by signs in there because Vygotsky does, in green, because Vygotsky does talk about the importance of the mediation, semiotic mediation. And what's happened, though, is huge emphasis is put on semiotic mediation and not on what Vygotsky was talking about, which was how does this semiotic mediation go to construct the internal system of meaning? And then, of course, we've talked about tools. So right in this sentence, this is the way that we are led into his major work. So he says that, oops, I think I did that too quickly, but he says that Znachenia Slova is the internal structure of the sign operation. So this unit then is the internal structure of the languaging process, of the mediation process. And so what he's looking at is this internal structure. And I've tried to create a, a diagram, and it's very difficult to take a mental structure. When we think about psychological structures and mental structures, the, there's the brain and the 100 billion neurons that provide the substrate in there. But to, to look at this, so in this diagram, we've got the different thinking processes, the languaging processes, and this is a unit of the structure of meaning that exists in the system of systems. So he's not just talking about the internal. So there is the biological substrate. And then as he goes up through the ages, he talks about critical periods and times of qualitative transformations at these these times, those times of qualitative transformation transform the whole structure, the whole mental structure. And so it's very important then to look at these critical periods in relationship to what they do to this internal structure, this the thinking, thinking languaging process. He doesn't write hardly at all about age 17, but intimates that it's probably, that it's that humans or yeah, students go out into the workplace, and in that, going out, they become exposed a lot more to class ideology, and so that that could be an important thing. But when we're looking at adults and using Vygotsky's framework, we need to look at what qualitative transformations take place at age 17. We can't just take concepts that he's talking about at different stages and just apply them to adults. And so that's, I think, and with this, it's important to always think with second language teaching and learning where a child is in this, or a person is in this internal structure of meaning. He says that the central tendency of the child's development is not a gradual socialization introduced from the outside but a gradual individualization that emerges on the foundation of the child's internal socialization. So he's talking in this about the importance of the socialization and that then is a, a key part of it. And as we talked about, sense really is another foundational piece of this structure, of in, this internal structure of meaning. 
And he, he talks about the key role that generalization plays. Um, he says that social interaction presupposes generalization and the development is in a chain of slova. Therefore, therefore, it may be appropriate to view Zdechenia Slova not only as a unity of thinking and languaging, but as a unity of generalization and social interaction, a unity of thinking and communication. And what he's reason he puts it as foundational is that generalization is an aspect of the word, that the, the remote control is generalized to all remote controls. And generalization is an act of thought. So that you have language and thinking being unified in generalization. So this concept of generalization is foundational and runs throughout all of his development of this internal structure of, of meaning. And so you get generalization of generalizations, so and then on up the, the scale, and he looks at these, especially in, in chapter six. But then there's the generalization of the thinking process that takes place with thinking in concepts, which is an important one. And this idea of, of conscious awareness so that a child, when they're going to school, be, they've used memory before, but they, they become consciously aware of the fact that they're using memory. They become consciously aware of attention. And for uh, teenagers, they become consciously aware of their thinking processes. And though that conscious awareness is a key aspect of this internal structure of meaning. He then writes about the transition from elementary psychical process to higher, how the use of language will bring about verbal perception, logical memory, voluntary attention. So language then is affecting the thinking process and the thinking process is affecting the languaging. And the ultimate goal is on achieving conceptual understanding. And we can maybe talk a little bit more about that in the, in the discussion. The first, he talks about three stages of, of, of uh, f three different forms of thinking. In the first, children are guided not by the objective connections present in the things themselves, but by the subjective connections that are given in their own perceptions. And this is that notion of sense, so that it's the child's connecting their sensuous input with the, the word. And then from syncretic thinking, he talks about complexes and outlines five different phases of thinking in complexes. But the, the key is like other modes of thinking, thinking in complexes leads to the formation of connections the establishment of relationships among different concrete impressions, the unification and generalization of separate objects, and the ordering and systematization of the whole of the child's experience. And so you, you get a feel for the development of this whole system of meaning that Vygotsky's writing about. And the difference here is that the connections are connections in the material world, empirical world. And so here is where that meaning coming into sense plays a big role. And then tied with the complex as he talks about everyday concepts, the, the sun rises, earth is flat, with academic concepts. And makes the point that the academic concepts that children are introduced to in school come from conceptual systems. And that these concepts then, he says, grow down into the subsoil that everyday concepts have. You can't have academic concepts without that subsoil. 
But it's not that they, it's, it, 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 it's a second story built on it. There's a penetration between the two. And this is where a key notion of his in imitation comes in. That the imitation that teachers do is not similar to the imitation we would think about with an animal imitating or a young, very young child imitating. What he's talking about is teachers providing transparency so that students can see the thinking processes that, the, the, that you need in order to access that concept and to imitate those thinking processes. By doing that, the, the teacher is helping to raise up the, the everyday concepts and to make the connection. He then says that this link between the two is the zone of proximal development. And this is a, a very different reading than the, the one we te tend to get and I'm sure that everybody here is familiar with. <coughs> I'll just leave that. And then the final is on the, the uh, development of concepts. And this, he says, takes place around age of, of 13. When a child begins thinking in concepts, is being able to use abstract thought as a key piece of their thinking process. The concept presupposes more than the unification and generalization of the di this distinct concrete elements of experience, which is what the description of complexes was. It presupposes the ability to view these isolated, abstracted elements independently of the concrete and empirical connections in which they are given. The true concept depends equally on the processes of analysis and synthesis. And so it's a qualitative step in this system, internal system of meaning that Vygotsky is describing. And with the development of concepts, well, I'm going to skip that. He then talks, too, about egocentric speech and inner speech. And he, he uses P Piaget's work to, as a foil to develop his own thinking on it. For Piaget, there was egocentric thinking that then led to egocentric speech, which that was very separate from the speech for others. And he said that social speech then, and you can't look at those two having any real, real relationship, that social speech just takes the place of egocentric speech, and egocentric speech disappears. Vygotsky, on the other hand, says initially that children have an undifferentiated speech for self and speech for others. The, the speech we were talking about was sense. And then through interaction and getting meaning, they begin to see that there are two different planes of speech. And he talks of egocentric speech as an independent melody of functions that facilitates intellectual orientation, conscious awareness, the overcoming of difficulties and impediments, and imagination and thinking. And so you can see that these are key pieces of the development of a child's thought. He then says that instead of social speech replacing egocentric speech, egocentric speech becomes internalized. But he says that in order to, for us to look at inner speech, we can best do so by looking at egocentric speech because egocentric speech is external. By looking at that, that we can get an idea of what the internal structure of thinking and speech is. And so he looks at the way that egocentric speech then develops into inner speech. Our analysis leads first to the differentiation of two planes of speech. Though they form a unity, the inner meaningful semantic aspect of speech is associated with different laws of movement than its external auditory aspect. These two planes do not correspond. 
the inner plane of speech is speech carried out almost without words. And one of the problems in looking at his work is that there's not a differentiation made between inner speech and the laws behind that and external speech. I had an example of inner speech when I was preparing this presentation. I was sitting in front of my computer going through it, you know, slide after slide, and it all went pretty smoothly. I didn't, didn't trip over many words, and that's because it, there hardly were any words there. But then when I started to do it externally, there was a lot of words that I could trip over. And I thought, I better do a little more on the external speech so I don't sound like Charlie Brown's teacher up here. So in inner speech, he says that the, the main, the key, one of the, well, first, this, this um, system is constantly expanding. So, and we've got the, this is the chain of slow, the internal system of meaning. One of the key planes of inner speech is within this thinking languaging system. But he also talks about a plane of pure thought. And then also talks about what lies behind thought. Thought just doesn't think itself. What is behind thought is affect. What are the motives, the inclinations, the needs? And that this motive is really that gives motion to the, the thought. So movement goes from the motive that gives birth to thought, to the formation of thought itself, to its mediation in the internal wor word, to the meanings of external words, and finally to words themselves. So this system of meaning in here is key to the externalization. But it's being done not just with word meanings. It's being done with meanings. So this is the structure of, of meaning that he, he talks about. And it was very frustrating in trying to prepare this talk because there's so much in here. And so what he talks about, this is what he describes in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And so my advice would be to go back to 5, 6, and 7 and read that with this notion in mind, I think it would be a lot easier to understand. And he then concludes and says, the primary result of this work is the conclusion that constitutes the conceptual center of our investigation. That is that Znachenia Slova develops. It is our major discovery, our new and fundamental contribution to the theory of thinking and speech. And it's a contribution that's virtually ignored if we're looking at a unit of human labor activity and not looking at this internal system that's developed. And when we, it gets translated, word meaning develops, people think, well, the meanings of words develop. He's not talking about that. He's talking about this internal system developing. And that's what his work was focused on. So to conclude, I thought I would bring a little bit of uh, Albuquerque culture to State College with our balloon fiesta that we have there. So that's the end. And as hot air, including the hot air lecturers, Can I follow up on that idea of, uh, because that, that concept of word meaning has always perturbed me, actually. I never, it seemed like such a limited kind of concept within the system, and so what you're saying really illuminates that for me, that idea of the personal meaning system or the individual's meaning system. So, but it seems like that's not itself a unit, or it's a unit that is filled with other kinds of concepts and units, right? So that what's developing in terms of that personal meaning, I mean, is he when he says that this is the unit that can be analyzed, he's talking about the building up of the system. Is that right? Correct. Okay. 
And so, in, but it's, it, it's meaning that becomes almost absent from words. Because as a child takes in the meaning, it gets infused with sense. It's their own personal meaning, and it then is not the same as the conventional meaning. And the tendency is, in looking at his work, and it's confusing, to be thinking that he's talking about this meaning, the external meaning of words, and not talking about this internal system structure of, of meaning. And that structure of meaning includes all of the, the right. thinking, all of that, including sense is a big, is a big piece of it. I think one of the implications of what you've been saying is that even word meaning in outside the child is open to, open to change because as people talk with each other, they use the same words, but th their meaning is rooted in the sense that they have developed over their lifetime. And if they're in powerful positions, like Leontia, uh, they can, in fact, change the meaning for a subset of the culture, which may, in fact, change it uh, for the culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's obvious, because language changes over generations. But it's, Vygotsky makes the point, too, though, that, that with sense, words take on a sense, and that sense also is instrumental in helping the meaning change because the sense becomes so that you know you give he gives the example of how you're doing or something like that. But you know if you're walking and you it's sup, you know what's up? It's this that's the sense. It's not the meaning. When all balloons are up, it's the sense that and so that sense plays a big role in the development of mean, external meanings of words. And he also says that it it's, has characteristics of com thinking in complexes, so that it then you can, you can take one meaning and then start using it to another meaning that's not necessarily connected to it, other than it's in the same sort of complex. So thank you for bringing it to that. It's nice to see you too. So, so um, I'm going to go back to your early discussion of uh, methodology. And the second meaning, the epistemological sense, sense of, of uh, method. I, I think what's missing from a lot of the way people talk about the theory is that the reason Vygotsky was proposing a new methodology was because he was proposing a new concept of what a human being is, right? Uh, a, a new ontology. And I think that's kind of missing from a lot of our discussion, and yet that seems to me at the core of the, the crisis, mm -hmm. right? He, he's, he's, he's saying that an individual is not self-contained, autonomous, being that becomes social, it's that the socialization process is what creates the individual in the first place, that as, as the culture penetrates the person, right, you become an individual. So, so there, the, the methodologies that had been developed in the way the science of psychology was understood, it was understood, particularly in, say, a Piagetian view or, or a Freudian view, right, as this, this self-contained, autonomous being. And the methodologies that were developed for trying to understand this were just not going to work for this new kind of understanding of what a, an individual is, right? And I think that's often missing from the discussions. And, and um, we recently had, a, if you look at the coming issue of second, second language acquisition where we had this discussion about uh, how to bridge the gap between the social and the cognitive, the social and the, right, 
for Pogusky, there's no gap. I mean, there really isn't a gap because he's talking about um, you don't become an individual until you become social, right? So, so, um, but people have argued, you know, and one of the people in, in, in that issue are arguing that Bogusky was simply proposing a new epistemology. I mean, why would you do that, mm -hmm. right? It makes, sort of makes no sense unless you understand that he's really coming from a completely different ontology of what it means to be a human being. Yeah, right? and I think that, that, that uh, when he talks about the philosophy, that's what he's talking about is that ontological aspect. And I, I think it's important, too, when we think about the, the individual. The individual exists from birth. The child becomes individualized, as the Bogatsky says, through that socialization process. Right. But it's that unity of those two things, the individual and the social, that really is the essence of humanity. And that's really what he was looking at, is what is the essence of the human psyche, and if we're looking at the human essence of the human psyche, we're really looking at the essence of a human being. He has one of one of his favorite quotes in there is he uses it several times. It comes from Marx's third volume, but it's that if appearance and essence were identical, there would be no need for science. science. Right. And we tend to deal with in psychology we're dealing a lot with that appearance and not with the essence. And that's where a dialectical approach, I think, is so important at getting to the essence of what's being studied, looking at the laws of motion behind it. You haven't spoken much so far about the educational implications of your presentation of the true Vygotsky. I would not be so presumptuous. <laughs> One of the things that strikes me particularly is that because sense is so important to our understanding of the world, no two people can ever fully understand each other, uh, or at least for practical purposes, they can, but they never understand exactly the same thing about what they think mm -hmm. they understand. Mm -hmm. And the implication for that of cl for classrooms and the way the curriculum is presented, as if it were as it, you know, straightforward and given, seems to me to be one of the most criminal aspects of contemporary education. <laughs> that we we force children to memorize and regurgitate definitions and so on without paying attention to or being interested in the sense that they bring to the so-called word meanings. Uh, yeah, I think I've said enough. Well, it's a it's, <laughs> it's, uh, perfect segue into this. The conceptual understanding that I had at the, at the top of the balloon. And I think it's important, first of all, to with a, have a terminological clarification, because sometimes people use conceptual knowledge, and other times conceptual understanding. And I think that it's crucially important for us to differentiate knowledge and understanding, because what Gordon was talking about was knowledge, that the way school is set up is that knowledge is transmitted to students. Students then regurgitate this knowledge on standardized tests, and there's some assumption that understanding is a occurring. And I, I just finished a six-year project with the U.S. Department of Education looking at how, how can teachers, secondary teachers, content area teachers facilitate the language and literacy development of their students at the same time that they're teaching the core concepts. And one of the things that we did in that, in the seminar that was made up of all of the practicing teachers, was to first look at 
what is it that teachers bring to the classroom? They can bring conceptual knowledge, and they do bring conceptual knowledge. Sometimes they bring conceptual understanding, and other times not. I, one of the teachers was in a, uh, teaching um, math at high school, and she was going to do a unit on quadratic equations. And so I asked her, what's the concept behind quadratic equations? And she gave the formula. And I said, well, no, but what's the concept behind it? And we teachers tend to be so immersed in their own content that it's very difficult for them to step outside of that content and try to understand what system of concepts their students have. So what I argue for is first we need to look at whatever the concept is. That concept belongs in a system. It has superordinate and it has subordinate concepts. And for the teacher, first of all, to think about this conceptual system, because what we're looking at in academic concepts is the way that concepts from a human understanding come into the classroom. Then having looked at that concept, to look at where students are in the development of that concept, to go to their lives, to try to see how, what their sense is what their meaning is of that concept. And then with those two things, then to look and see where's the, the meeting ground? Where's the zone of proximal development? And so this idea of education really aiming for conceptual understanding is huge because you can have knowledge without understanding, but you can't have understanding without knowledge. And real understanding means that you can take a concept and apply it in circumstances different than the one in which it was learned. And that's huge. So that a student goes through a class, an English class on genre, and they get the concept of classification and categorization. That concept can carry over to history, to biology, to others. So it's helping students really develop conceptual understanding right from the very, very beginning. And so it's, I, I, I think what you say about the education system is spot on. And my approach to, is to help teachers really think deeply both about the nature of the understanding of the concept they're teaching and the lives of the students and trying to make that human connection with students. So you have a microphone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. Um, you, you have a lot of things in your lecture, so I, I'm hoping I got some things right. <laughs> but um, uh, in the uh, PowerPoint uh, was I, I can't, I can't see. structure of meaning in the thinking and language uh, system, you introduce the ideas of um, everyday concepts, academic concepts, along with other things. And when those concepts are discussed in, particularly in educational literature, it's considered to be vertical, vertically hierarchical. So you have to build on everyday concepts uh, and then reach this higher level. But I have been sort of, if sense is so important, then that kind of hierarchical structure should not exist, right? That, that there is sort of that intermeshing and um, of, um, between the two, th th there has to be fluid movement, but it, it's often the case, like if you think about core, common core in academic language development, it's like, okay, so everyday uh, concept is fine, but we have to take the students to um, academic concepts as if everyday concept doesn't have a place, and, um, but as we all know, everyday conversation in academic context is mixed genre. It's really recruiting different genres uh, depending on the context of situation that makes anyone academically or communicatively competent in having uh, expanding repertoire. So, so I just wondered if you have some thoughts about uh, how 
these ideas are taken up and how you think about everyday concept and academic concept. But they, thank you for the question. Um, the, the thing with, with everyday concepts is that they're not part of the system. That's their de a defining aspect of them, that it can be you have concepts that run side by side. And so academic concepts are defined as concepts in systems. And so there is that, that difference. And I like your, you're not you're saying we shouldn't really be talking about higher. And I was going to, in here, instead of using higher psychical processes, I was going to use the word cultured psychical processes, that these elementary mental process, psychical processes have culture, become culture, enculturated through language. And th that's the defining characteristic of those processes is that culture has, is it becomes a major part of it. And I think it could, the same thing could be said about academic concepts and everyday concepts in that the everyday concepts, they don't just disappear. People, adults use everyday concepts every day. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and academic concepts don't just start when the child walks into the classroom. But it is this relationship, but he's, the key piece in it is one is part of a system and the other isn't. And you can't have that system just sort of top down if a child doesn't already have the beginning of the concept. So you have a concept of brother, and a child, their sense of, they have a sense of brother, but they don't have the concept of brother. They can't define brother. And that's where the academic meaning comes in. And so it's this process of, with this, the balloon is that these concepts are coming in from systems. And that's, those systems are, only can come in to the child's, individual child's psyche. And it doesn't matter if we just, you know, beat it into them. They're not going to really get the concept unless the teacher makes the effort to combine it with their sense and with their everyday concepts. Does that help or? <laughs> um, so I was, I'm really interested in this idea of generalization and how um, people might have like this unspoken kind of understanding. So from a teacher to student, you have this idea that there's, there's an unspoken concept that a child might have already. Whereas, um, as you had mentioned, there's this academic kind of understanding above that, right? So how is it that a teacher comes to know that a student doesn't necessarily already have a developed concept to the level that they're kind of attempting to have the student reach? I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you might have anything to, state, to say about that. I, well, I don't know if I stated I, that I can properly give, enough. I can give you a, a, what I, I did in practice. And that is for this project, I developed something. The project is academic literacy for all. And what I did was to develop we, something we call the academic literacy for all, the ALA protocol. We call it a protocol because it's not just a technique, it's sort of a system. And what we do is the teacher gets a concept that they're going to put in their unit and then really explores that concept and then tries to think about how that concept might fit into the everyday lives of their students and puts a prompt on the board. Students are in groups of four. And each student, and one of the key things about the concept is that every student has to be able to write two sentences about it. Teachers tend to, if they're going to do a, a unit on photosynthesis, their prompt is, what is photosynthesis? Sort of the end result. A prompt that we came up with for photosynthesis is, how can you tell if something's alive? Removed from it. Somebody came up for a prompt on Romeo and Juliet. Why do people go to movies? <laughs> and you get romance and tragedy and war. But 
that each student writes two sentences on a card about the, that prompt. And they can write in their native language because it's a lot easier to access a concept if you're using your native language than one in which you're not strong. So they would write two sentences, and then there's no right and wrong. Then a partner, they would, on another card, take the two sentences and combine them into two other sentences, two new sentences. So they're using the, the language, using the kind. Then with the group as a whole, they then come up with two more sentences. So in this process, they're writing to learn, which is one very good way to get the, whether they get the concept or not. Through dialogue, they are developing the idea. And in this group, they're hearing a lot of, of language, getting different perspectives on it, broadening their, the concept of it. Then we take those and put them up on a on poster board. And then the teacher reads them out. And then each individual writes which one they like best. They can't choose their own group. So in having to do that, they have to start using academic thinking, comparing, contrasting, analysis, synthesis. And so we don't often focus in on what thinking processes do students need in order to access the concept. And this is the key point that Vygotsky makes about thinking in, in concepts, is that the, the concepts that are being given to middle school teenagers need a, the ability to think in concepts in order to access them. And so he talks about this relationship between the content of the concept and the form of the, the content, the form of the thinking having to be in sync. And so that, that is a, a key piece of that, that process. He even says that by the time they get to thinking in concepts, this is in a chain you slow, that it's this internal meaning system and the system, the child's systems of concepts pretty much become this, the same. So the students then, after they vote, then they, in their groups, begin to talk and come up with a consensus. Again, negotiating, thinking about it, using language. For a second language learner, they've got the opportunity to write in their native language. If they have somebody who's bilingual, they can then begin to get the English words that are involved with the concept. They're hearing the language. They're using, they have an opportunity to use that language in pairs, which is huge. You go into a high school and the opportunity for, you could have an, an English language learner go through the entire day and not say anything in any class. And then after they voted on them, we look at themes that run through them. And then we look at words like, we call logical connectors, words like because or if and then, which are huge to understanding, but they're not words that we focus in on. And then, so we talk about those, and then we put a piece of academic text from the book, from the teacher, that then gives the academic concept. So the teacher, at the end of the day, has a card for each student with their initial to see where they're at in the concept, to see the process of dialogue and collaboration and, and thinking in, in a, a group. And then the, the teacher has, I think, a a real snapshot then of where the child is at or the student is at. And from that then, you build, start building transition activities that take them to conceptual understanding. And it gives them a way into academic text as opposed to read you know, page 75 to 80 in your science textbook, which no one's going to do. They, they they give them the ability, because the students then are asked, you know, what ideas are in this academic text that are also reflected on the board? Well, we said this, we said that, we said it differently. Why is it, why, why do textbook companies use academic language? What is that academic language and how to take it apart to make it accessible to students? So.
this thing of generalization, I, I, you know, I, was, I knew that I was going to be running on, late on but over, but I wanted to make that point for the, at the beginning for the, because I, I think Vygotsky's work has been, as you obviously can see, has been very, very badly misrepresented and that the heart of his, his work has been pretty much cast aside. And my reading of the chapters 5, 6, and 7 is this is what he's, he's talking about. But they're so, it's so full and rich that I was very fr it was very frustrating trying to pick out. And the, the concept of generalization, he goes into in, in great depth in there, and especially looks in chapter 6, he compares it to the, a globe with the, the most concrete at the South Pole, the most abstract at the top. And so that's the form of thinking, and then the content of thinking he looks at as the latitude. And so when the, where those intersect is where the, the concept in the, is in terms of the child's development. And so, you know, as a, as a practicing teacher, one of the key things is to really find out all along the, the way, and I think this is where dynamic assessment is so powerful, all along the way, where the students are, are, what are they getting? And you can't just wait until the final exam to see whether they have the conceptual understanding. I must say, I just want to say one thing, and that is that um, today I've met with Meredith and Lindsay and Alasha. You say it. Aliasha. Aliasha. Close enough. And Kim, there you are. And I have learned a tremendous amount from each one of them. And I was telling Jim ahead of that, that I was very impressed with the, the students here. And I, I think that uh, you're lucky. <laughs> and I think they are lucky as well. So. <laughs> well, I don't know who's faculty. Who's, who is faculty here? Are there any? I, oh, okay. And how do you happen to be here, Gordon? Are you teaching at all here or no? Oh. Yes. <laughs> I know you're all second language, or most, a lot of you are second language teachers and, or in that field. And so you, you do know uh, total physical response. And so we're going to do just a little exercise in total physical response here, where when my hands cross, you clap, OK? With, with volume. 